Indiana University, and he'll be talking about astrophysical interplay dark matter searches. So please welcome our speaker. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, so I hope uh, today what I'm going to give is a more, uh, more or less interdisciplinary talk on uh, our modern understanding of dark matter and uh, particularly dark matter searches from different different angles. Um, particularly, I'm going to explain and understand why if we're going to make progress on uh, identifying the nature of particle dark matter. We need to understand where dark matter is and how it's distributed. Uh, we need to prove our theories and then understand how to connect these theories to, to observational data. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is how, to, how to do this and progress we've made along these lines and how it affects what we're seeing um, or not seeing in various various dark matter searches around around the world. Okay, so I'm going to kind of start off very broadly here to sort of set in historical context. Um, you know, much of this will be reviewed for many of you in the audience, but I but I think you know we're, it's a really important time in this field. So uh, I, th I think it's good to sort of give a historical background of where 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 we started. So of course, dark matter was established uh, uh, going back to the 1930s, maybe even a little, little earlier by measurements of uh, this uh, famous astronomer, Jan Oort, uh, who uh, measured uh, the vertical motions of stars in the disk of our Milky Way galaxy and deduced that was about, there was about two times more mass in the disk than could be accounted for by, by the stars that he saw. Uh, perhaps more famously, a little bit later, uh, Fritz Zwicky, uh, the famous astronomer, measured the motions of galaxies in the coma cluster and determined that there was, uh, many, there was a Tens to hundreds, maybe thousands of times more mass in the in the in the, in the nearby coma cluster of galaxy than was uh, in the observed uh, in the observed objects that he saw based upon measuring their velocity dispersion. So these these observations have kind of kind of stuck around for for a few decades, and then took a you know 1960s, 70s, early 80s uh, pioneering astronomers such as Vera Rubin here measured the rotation curves of nearby spiral galaxies and noticed that that there was significantly more mass contained within these systems than you could account for. By the luminous stars and gas, and of course the the real the real breakthrough here was measuring these rotation curves out to large radii, uh, where you can where you can see clearly see the presence of, of dark matter. Uh, these re these results were, were corroborated by many different uh, astronomers uh, during this time, uh, and you know even though initially it was thought that these results were due to systematic uncertainties, you know observational effects uh, in, in in these measurements, uh, it really became clear that several groups came up with a similar answer that. That, that there should be much more mass out in these systems, and these rotation curves didn't fall off like you'd expect just by looking at the luminous material. Okay, so, right, if you're an astronomer, what's the first thing you think of? There's lots of junk in the universe that I can't see with my telescopes. So, uh, really, the, one of the first questions that we ask is, is, that could be asked is, you know, is dark matter, low mass stars, rogue planets, black holes that we just can't detect uh, with, with the telescopes at the time? Well, it turns out even though you couldn't detect objects of this sort uh, with uh, with sort of standard astronomical telescopes, you could detect them through other effects. For example, the effect of gravitational lensing, which was originally uh, formulated uh, by Einstein uh, nearly a century ago. Uh, using uh, this technique of gravitational lensing, um, it was possible to do surveys for uh, specifically microlensing technique to do surveys for faint uh, compact bodies, uh, specifically in our Milky Way galaxy. So these, these objects could have a size anywhere from solar mass down to, uh, down to the mass of about Mercury. Uh, and these objects would be detected in these surveys. Um, so going back uh, a couple decades now to the 90s, uh, these, these were started. Uh, and uh, they actually concluded that, that a large fraction of the mass of our Milky Way cannot be dominated by, by compact bodies that, that have mass similar to uh, would be ascribed to planets. Uh, and actually, so even though these objects did not tell us that the dark matter is in this form, they actually did give us really a very fundamental understanding of our knowledge of dark matter, that it doesn't clump into compact bodies of this mass, but it's rather distributed more diffusively uh, throughout galactic, galactic halos. Okay. So the next step then is to say that it's uh, connected to some uh, unknown elementary particle of nature that has not been detected uh, within our standard model. Of course, there is uh, the attempts to explain dark matter in terms of neutrinos uh, going back going back a few decades. Uh, that turns out not to be true just by looking at the pattern of large scale structure. So, so now we're of course left in a situation where, where the dark matter is not contained within our known standard model of particle physics, uh, but uh, that does not mean that they're not good candidates for dark matter. In fact, the standard job of a theoretical cosmologist going back now uh, many years is to postulate the existence of a particle, you know, demand that that particle has to exist by, you know, by some theory, and then, and then solve for its abundance, uh, given that, 
given that, say, the particle was in equilibrium early in the early universe. Okay, this is, it doesn't strictly have to be true, but, but, it's, but it's a good theoretical starting ground here. Um, so if you do, of course, uh, take a particle, a dark matter particle that was in thermal equilibrium in the early universe, you can sort of very simply, uh, going back to Zeldovich, calculate um, uh, what the annihilation cross section, what the annihilation cross section of that particle is here in terms of its a relative velocity times times the times the cross section here times the actual annihilation cross section. You can relate that to the to the to the modern day relic of abundance of dark matter. And of course, if you if you uh, take the measurements from uh, from W map Planck for the abundance of the dark matter, uh, and you plug this in here, you get it. You get a number for this annihilation cross section about three times ten to the minus twenty six uh, centimeters cubed per second, and that roughly corresponds to a weakly interacting uh, particle. Okay. So uh, what we don't know here at this stage is whether this is purely a coincidence or whether this is telling us that dark matter is a weakly interacting massive particle. Um, what this fact does do, of course, is it tells us that WIMPs are a leading candidate for dark matter in the universe, and it gives us a very, very concrete theoretical prediction for this scale that we should, we should be searching uh, for the presence of, of dark matter particles. Okay, so this is sort of the background that motivates what, what we're going to uh, do going forward here in, in, in the models we're going to try to probe. Of course, it's well known, there's uh, several different techniques to try to detect dark matter particles, um, very, very broadly here classified into uh, four different methods. So indirect methods, of course, uh, depend upon uh, annihilation of dark matter particles uh, in regions of high density uh, in the universe today, uh, producing standard model particles such as photons, neutrinos, etc. And these things are detected by, by, by modern uh, astroparticle experiments. Of course, this cross-section is most closely related to, to this, this, this cosmological freeze-out cross-section against which the dark matter was, cre was created. Um, of course, you know, direct detection searches are going on around the world to search for uh, dark matter particles scattering off nucleons in underground detectors. Um, a little bit of it, th this, this of course is not the annihilation cross-section, which is you know, how dark matter scatters off nucleons, uh, ultimately quarks. Of course, um, and uh, this, the, these, these techniques are now, uh, now uh, there's lots of, lots of new results going, going on in this field, and of course, uh, as, we'll, as we'll talk about, I guess, at the end of this month, we're supposed to hear some more. Um, direct production of dark matter, of course, uh, happens at the LHC. Uh, you know, one can make an argument that this, this, is, this is, you know, if, if you're a betting person, this might be the first place where you'd see, you know, clearly see evidence of new particles. Of course, we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, at the LHC. I, I, will, I, I won't talk too much about this, I'll just very briefly mention how this interplays with some recent results that we obtained from, from the previous methods. And then I'll spend like the last half of my talk what I, what I call more astronomical methods to probe for the particle nature of dark matter. So you know, how does the structure of galaxies that we observe, how does the distribution of the dark matter in the galaxies, how does that tell us about the microscopic nature of particle dark matter? I think there's really interesting results going on uh, that, are, that are coming online here, that, but we have to re re be really careful about how we're interpreting uh, these, uh, these measurements. So, so I'll spend a lot of portion of my talk talking about, um, talking about the, this model. And for example, this tells us, this is really interesting because it you know, can, can tell us, does the dark matter have a large, you know, quote unquote, self-interacting cross-section? Is, is the dark matter like to interact with itself for some reason more than does the standard model particles? Okay, um, so let me start off uh, talking a bit about the, my first bullet point there, which is uh, methods for indirect dark matter detection. Now, I'm going to really sort of narrow the focus here on some, some, some recent results that we've obtained that I feel are really interesting. So, as I mentioned, um, uh, indirect dark matter detection uh, relies on uh, dark matter particle scattering via some new physics uh, to, uh, to quarks or leptons or other final state standard model particles. And this is a very just rough schematic of how this works. Um, you know, in typical scenarios, you might, you might expect 10 to hundreds of photons that are produced per annihilation of dark matter particles. So, so the idea is, once again, you go to regions of high dark matter density in the universe to look for the signal. Uh, and sort of uh, set a scale here for you, um, uh, if you have a, a WIMP of mass 100 GeV, which is where we might nominally think the first look for the presence of these particles, uh, the, uh, this, if these particles annihilate, that might give us ultimately uh, gamma rays uh, in, in the band, in an energy band, approximately 10 to uh, 10 mega electron volts to about 10 giga electron volts or so once, once you do all the scattering uh, uh, and, you know, the, uh, once you scatter the quarks and the leptons and these quarks and leptons ultimately decay and produce photons that we see. And, you know, okay, of course, you know, you can have different final states and, and you, should just, you should just appreciate that the spectra looks very different uh, for different, different, different types of scenarios that you can cock, right? Not only can you can get you know, so-called continuum signals of gamma rays via this method, which you can also get, you know, ultimately get a theory that predicts a line, right, uh, that, that this, this might work, and that's, you know, people talk about that in terms of a smoking gun signal uh, for the dark matter. Um, 
Okay. So I'm going to talk less about, actually I'm not going to talk much at all about the particle models, but... Uh, Why don't we get more photons for the atomic final stage than the particle final stage? Uh, I always guess you get lots of pi zeros at the end. Oh, so this the depends upon the left, so if we go to tau's, right? You can hadronize there, ultimately, right? And, and, then produce, and then produce final state radiation as well. Because he's using, he's using yeah. tau's would roughly be equal. Yeah. And well, not so necessarily, depending on the mass, right? If they've got 100 GeV. Yeah. Um, yeah. you get lots of pi zeros to gamma gamma. So you get you get you get the, the if you go to tau for example you hadronize certainly, and then you get you get final state radiation components from the the the, the leptons right as well. You, you get. Why would you get more than four? I guess that's true. Right? Uh, How do you count the photon? Some special? Pardon me? How do you count so yeah, we're counting photons above the threshold here, right? But, but yeah, so so for a given width mass, yeah, so uh, right, so so for a given width mass, let's see, let's see how this. Maybe it's because they're more compact. The cows are more collimated. You're going to get. It, 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 it is a threshold effect too, right? Where do you get? Where, yeah, at, at what energies do you get? You get these photons. Ah, yeah, yeah. Like high energy yeah. photons. Yeah, and I will admit I don't know exactly what energy I used here. My, my, I, 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 probably a lower bound something along these lines. Yeah, but that, that, that's that's a good that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Because certainly the tau final states will give you much much more low energies here. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, okay. Good. So. Broad motivation here, so let me now uh, go forward to discuss um, uh, some recent results we've obtained uh, from uh, the uh, Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, and I believe you had a talk about this last week from Salas Kuciatis. Um, uh, uh, but uh, let, let me let me let me just sort of give you a broad overview of what this what this satellite does. Again, so Fermi um, was launched in 2008, summer 2008, into low uh, Earth orbit. Uh, it makes a gamma ray sky. It makes a map of the gamma ray sky once every three hours, and this is probably the most one of the more famous pictures you've seen that come as a result of Fermi. Um, it is uh, the, a map in galactic coordinates, so where the where the galactic center here is in the middle, uh, and here's here's the the disk of our Milky Way galaxy. So this bright emission that you see comes uh, from uh, cosmic ray particles coming in and scattering off uh, particles in the interstellar medium that ultimately uh, create high energy photons, uh, and this is integrated over all Fermi energies of uh, 100 MeV and above. Um, uh, in this disk, of course, you see some point sources, which are supernova remnants. Above this disk, sort of in more cosmological distance, you see active galactic nuclei, blazars, uh, etc. Um, uh, so these are this is sort of the dominant contributions to uh, to the Fermi All Sky Gamma Ray Map. Uh, we can be a bit more quantitative about that. So uh, to, uh, after two years, uh, Fermi produced a. Uh, a point source catalog of its known sources, of its known point sources that it's seen in the sky. Okay, um, uh, there's about 1,800 or so point sources in total after two years. So this hasn't, so even though now we're about four or five years into the mission, um, it hasn't, it hasn't, we haven't added two anymore. Most of them were detected in the first few years. Um, most of the known identified sources uh, uh, correspond to active galactic nuclei, these objects at the, the cosmological distances above the galactic plane. Um, and uh, this is sort of the Second most populous source here that's known are those, those pulsars, supernova remnants that sit in the galactic plane, and these can be identified with um, astronomical sources at other wavelengths as well. Okay, so that's how this is done. Um, uh, interestingly enough, Fermi has detected a few globular clusters. This is the first time globular clusters have ever been detected in gamma rays as sources. These are believed to be those believed to be pulsars uh, that are contained within within the globular clusters that are that are emitting these gamma rays. Um, uh, you know. Galaxies like our own Milky Way have been detected. Uh, so the Milky Way, you know, you saw that strip of gamma rays that comes. So there's a few of those objects that have now been detected by Fermi, uh, maybe about 10 or so, and they're very nearby, you know, Magellanic Clouds, M31, et cetera, and they have to be sort of very starbursty. Uh, but so, you know, we detect the quote, normal galaxies like the Milky Way as well. Um, interesting, interestingly enough, 30% um, uh, of the sources that have been detected in the Fermi and our catalog as, as sources are, are completely uncorrelated in any other astronomical wave, uh, wave band, so you know, they're, they're, they're unidentified uh, and, and, and their nature is not known. So, so for example, if we're looking for dark matter sources, this might be the first place that we start to start looking uh, through this pile here. Um, is there any correlation between unassigned 
egress sources of Fermi sources? Oh, it's, uh, yes, but Fermi, of course, has much better spatial resolution, much better energy resolution. So basically, whatever egrets found, Fermi's found and done much better. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, so this is gonna be a talk about dark matter. So uh, um, so let me talk about what we do when we do searches for dark matter. Of course, Fermi's an all-sky uh, all survey, so it's able to detect particle dark matter from all kinds of sources in the universe. Um, there's all the sources, of, different sources have been studied. Uh, the galactic center here is the brightest spot uh, that you'd expect. Um, if you had gamma ray eyes, which you do when you're looking at this map here, um, uh, and uh, the, here, here's the center of our galaxy, so we should expect a large flux from that region. Um, you know, the satellite galaxies, which I'll spend the time talking about here. Um, you also search for clusters of galaxies. All, all these signatures are very unique. Of course, you know, dark matter particles are diffusively annihilating throughout our whole Milky Way galaxy and you know, around throughout the whole universe. So we should, at some level, see some diffuse signature, you know, from cosmological scales. Um, that that's coming that's coming uh, that's coming from particles annihilating. Um, so so all these sources can be studied. Um, what I uh, uh, been particularly interested in the last few years are these dwarf galaxies or Milky Way satellites. It, um, and uh, what I'm going to present here is uh, the next few slides is some results we've obtained uh, from uh, from these measurements and also just uh, show some recent updates that just came on the archive a few days ago actually. Okay, so uh, so I'll sort of interchangeably call uh, Milky Way satellite galaxy dwarf Schrödel. This is the astronomical name by which most of them go by. Um, here's a map of their distribution in the sky. So right now we we know about of about two dozen uh, faint satellite galaxies, and these are really really interesting astronomical systems. And I'll I'll talk a little more about the the astrophysical aspects of these later on in the talk. Um, but the idea here is most of these are cl clustered up here in the northern hemisphere because that's where we surveyed. Uh, in the most depth, particularly with the Sloan General Sky Survey. Um, and uh, these galaxies, although they're very faint, they're close enough that we can resolve individual stars within the galaxies, right? And that's very rare. So you can actually see the motions of the stars, so you can use the motions of the well, stars. Are, to, how many stars are each of these four? Um, so the brightest one has 10 to the 7. The, the faintest one has 100. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so the brightest one here is Fornax, say, or Sagittarius, which you did there, Sagittarius. Um, this is of course getting wrecked here because it's these big tidal tails. You know, that's really interesting. Uh, and the fainter ones, uh, or Segway one here, it's, you know, we're just debating about whether we can call it a galaxy or not. So, right. um, okay, we're good. So, so what I'm going to call, what I'm going to do here, is just right. We, we we know that these are the most dark matter dominated systems we know in the universe. You know, tens, hundreds, thousands of times more. Or dark matter mass and luminous mass in these systems, um, uh, and you know the, the wide luminosity range as I mentioned. But very interestingly, for the perspectives of these measurements here, there's you know there's no interstellar medium of gas, right? They're all just old dead stars, so we don't expect and we don't find any sort of intrinsic gamma ray emission from these systems from an astronomical perspective. Okay, so here's uh, I guess a bit of a cartoon about how this goes, right? So you identify one of these objects um, in visible light. Here's for example, look down here. Even, right, even if you squint, these are sort of hard to make out against the background. Uh, Event against the background stars, right? Uh, but but you can uh, here here's a region of the sky of one of the older, well-known dwarf spheroidal Draco, which was discovered back in the 30s. And here's a region of the sky, segment one. And I believe I've got the individual stars of this galaxy circled in green, right? But you but, but you know once again you're not going to be able to pick this out uh, just by staring at this region of the sky. You have to do color cuts to to determine these uh, to determine there's actually over densities in this region. Okay, so you find this in your astronomical surveys, and then you go over and you do a, a, a counts map in Fermi, and these are sort of smooth uh, background maps uh, that, are, that are done in gamma rays, and sort of the sources here, these galaxies here would be in the center of these sources, of these maps, and you see we see no excess emission uh, from this source here, uh, we, uh, from this region of the sky. We do, see, um, we do see background sources within a few degrees, uh, and these are, these are those active black nuclei or other astrophysical sources. Okay, so uh, so we don't have a detection yet of any of these objects, okay, um, which uh, we can turn into something interesting because we know their dark matter mass distributions from from the motions of these individual stars, and we spent a significant time, part of the last few years, uh, constructing algorithms to try to best extract this information. Uh, and when we combine this, we combine these results with the with the upper flux limits that are seen from Fermi, from Fermi, those null detections, we can get an upper limit on the dark matter annihilation cross-section as a function of the wind mass here, okay, and here's these individual, these individual colored lines here, 
show the individual limits from each dwarf toroidal. Um, and uh, these, are, these, are, these are all individually shown here, there's about 10 of them. But then when you sort of co-add or stack these together, uh, as we did in 2011, what happens is you get a, 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 a limit here that crosses this so-called thermorelic scale at about uh, 20 or so GeV and below. So, so the way to interpret these bounds is anything above these is ruled out at the 95% confidence limit based upon uh, how, how we've constructed this, um, this, this, these observations. Okay. So this is really interesting. Uh, you know, we can't really overstate this result enough. This is, this is I think, the first time uh, astrophysical observations have now uh, probed you know, thermal relic scale particle dark matter, right? And this has just happened within within a couple of Fermi years of data. Is there a yeah. reason you stop ten Yeah, because this is assumed okay, this is assumed annihilated into B quarks. Right? And yeah, yeah. And that's and, and also the other thing too is this gives a the, your threshold, so this gives a we're looking for photons above a certain energy threshold because that's where we reduce the systematics uh, enough. So anything below we just throw it out. Okay, so so yeah, so so these models here give you too many photons below, sort of below the Fermi energy threshold. Yeah. So I mean, so well, it's, I would guess that your your sensitivity would eventually just turn back up. Again. Oh yeah, I mean, well, eventually, I mean, for PV bar, right? You don't at four GB, you get nothing, right? So I mean, so we get no, right? Uh, yeah, that depends. I mean, so this there is a specific, right? This is a specific channel here. That's been seen. actually. So you might actually more clearly see this. The next slide. Which is a paper we just uh, put on the archive um, a couple weeks ago. Actually, sort of new four-year results for the dwarf spheroidals, um, and uh, the 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 conclusion here is uh, that we we have no significant detection. So um, so the BB bar channels here, this course was the one I've shown before. What you really want to keep your eye on here is this these black curves here because these are the upper these are the 95 percent confidence upper limits again, and they did change a little bit. Um, uh, from year uh, uh, from year two to year four, it's a little bit of a technical reason, um, but but I think we're still the, the results are still more or less consistent. You know, there's going to be much made. I'm just sort of warning you. There's going to be much made about uh, the fact that uh, we showed these Monte Carlo bands here, which give us our expected limits after those numbers of years. And at low masses, these tend to not occur. well. The way you look at this figure, the way you visually see this figure. Uh, these these the, these 95 percent confidence limits are in some cases disagree with the colored bands. Um, it turns out this is not a statistically significant result. Okay, uh, uh, it turns out there there is some noise down here that we actually don't yet know how to explain, but it's certainly it's not at all smelling like anything dark matter related. Uh, this noise is appearing in in all different galaxies, all of all different shapes and sizes. So it's not really correlating in any way with. You know our best quote target. So, so, so this is right. You have to be careful. I, I will before you actually, you know, and you see people interpreting this figure. It, it, it probably going to go through and read the text of what was said here. Um, so, but it, because you can imagine how it's a little bit right. You know, looking at these, you might see okay, well that's a signal, right? That you, you know, your Monte Carlo is not reproducing there. What, what, what's going on there? But, but it's a little bit. Um, so it looks like you're doing best in the UU bar. Out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, and that's the other thing too. This appears in all channels, right? So, there's I think there's many reasons to think that this is there's uh, yeah. So I think just you know be be a little bit careful when you uh, when you're uh, when you're when you're potentially reading uh, analysis going on uh, uh, in the next few weeks, and months or so. Okay. So I do want to uh, so I just want to make something brief because I actually don't. I'm making a brief side point here about how this relates to some recent results that have come out of uh, the ATLAS uh, um, uh, experiment to do something very similar here. Of course, you know you have to make uh, you have to make theoretical assumptions about uh, the particular type of wimp that you have in order to turn these limits here that Fermi has seen into into a, a limit a, a limit on the uh, the direct production of wimps at ATLAS. But if you do make a couple specific assumptions, for example, here was made about it being a direct fermion. And you have vector axial vector reactions. Uh, you know, looking for these monojet, monophoton type signals. Uh, Atlas actually uh, has has published a result uh, late 2012 that says, well, if we make this particular assumptions uh, and we turn this cross section around, we can actually do better than the Fermi bounds uh, in this particular case. But once again, this is a specific assumption. Uh, but I think this is this is really, and I think this is sort of an interesting, uh, sort of very simple way that these two 
uh, experiments are now are, are now um, um, you know, corroborating with one another. Okay. So that's just a brief point I wanted to make about, about the Doris Roto results. Um, so I, I won't talk too much about any other sources. You know, we can we can talk all day about you know diffuse gamma rays and everything that Fermi is seeing or not seeing. I will just point out here, um, you know, clusters of gal each 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 source gives its own set, set of different systematics with it, right? Clusters of galaxies actually turned out to be, I mean, they're good targets. Uh, th there's some theoretical systematics going in there in terms of determining the dark matter distributions that give us maybe two to three order of magnitude uncertainty on uh, how, much, how much dark matter is sitting in there. Um, but there have been some results published. Uh, for example, diffuse extragalactic background results have been published. I said, you know, it's cosmological signal. Um, diffuse halo results. So it's so really the only two results at this stage that have claimed uh, sensitivity to the thermal relic scale at 10 GeV here at dwarf Schroedels in the diffuse measurements of, of particles annihilating throughout our Milky Way galaxy. I do think this, personally I think this dwarf Schroedel signal is much more robust because we, we have a better established method to calculate the dark matter distributions in these systems than we do sort of uh, uh, in, in the, in diffusively in the Milky Way galaxy. It turns out that latter signal is much more sensitive to, to your, your astrophysical systematics. Um, you know, lines, um, I, I, I'm not going to talk about the lines. I think, I think it's, we're, we're now converging on the fact that we have a systematic going on that we don't understand. Um, probably not, probably not um, uh, uh, dark matter related. Um, but that's sort of where we stand here with these results. And I think in the next few years, I think really one of the goals we want to do with the Fermi measurements is here at 100 GeV here, see how close we can get down, we can get down to the thermal relic scale here at 100 GeV. Right, and, you know, we're going to go still for a few more years and, and learn more about this data. You know, more clean data sets are coming out. So, so, so that's sort of the goal where we're going here in the next few years. So that sort of closes up my uh, my what I'm going to talk about for indirect searches. And you remember, sort of the theme of this talk is how does how does you know ask for, uh, where is dark matter? How is it distributed? How does that um, uh, interplay with what we are observing in these searches? So, sort of on that theme here, I want to talk a little bit about some work we've been doing. Uh, uh, interpreting some of the direct searches. Yeah. Okay. How about unassigned sources? So you, you you already have the detection, you know, gamma rays from completely yeah. unassigned objects. Uh, if you have the spectra, right? What so, kind of source? Do you, well, yeah. I mean, there is nothing there, nothing else. So there's I many want to um, dark matter, you know, objects of the same, yeah. like you know, a, a gene's mass of the same scale, like I don't know, ten to the four, five, or whatever. I don't know what you mean by that, but uh, but uh. I mean, so, the, so, so there's a few problems here, right? One, you know, the, for dark matter, we have a unique prediction of the spectra, right? Meaning right. bar, quarks, yeah. leptons, etc. Um, that turned out to look very similar to <laughs> spectra of sort of known astronomical objects, such as pulsars. You know, they both give, you know, there's a variety of the wide range of types of spectra we see out of pulsars, cutting off sort of in this GE range as well. So, um, and when you kind of when you really stack those two up against each other, so actually we had a paper a couple years ago. I actually didn't report the results searching for dark subhalos around the Milky Way galaxy uh, um, using basically those sources, right? And and there's many there's many difficulties here, right? One one of which is exactly when you know we plotted you know particular dark matter 100 GeV dark matter spectrum annihilating the quarks versus some example pulsar spectra, and they more or less look exactly the same. So, um, no. um, I mean, I'm not saying don't do it. I think we should, we should still, you know, try to find something. Um, but you know, if we're if we're in the business of like setting robust limits that that the whole community can believe, I think. Um, I have a question, but in case of Hawthorne, is it not possible to resolve and support sources? Yeah, you can resolve, but but there's many uh, source there's many pulsars out there that we haven't sure. you know uh, identified, right? Yeah, I mean, for the most sources, maybe you can't really distinguish them, but for pulsars inside this galaxy, I think maybe that just has a. Oh, I mean, that is true. Like, uh, it's certainly when you see those unaffiliated sources, those 30%, a large fraction of them are, are sitting in the galactic disk, actually. <laughs> right? And they're not distributed, maybe like you would expect dark matter sources to be. And that, that's one of the reasons why we're, we're led away from the dark matter interpretation. Um, and, it, and also, too, there's lots of foreground noise just from the, from the galactic disk, right? That's contaminating what we might extract out of the signal. So. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough game, man. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, so let me spend a few minutes here moving on because I think there's 
Um, just a couple of sort of interesting points to be made about um, results with direct searches that I know some people here are particularly interested in. Um, of course, let me just very, very briefly re review this to put us on the same page here. Uh, I was talking about dark matter annihilation signals, now I'm talking about WIMPs scattering off nucleons and underground detectors. Um, and what, what happens here, of course, has been known since the 1980s, is that uh, you, you get uh, th this nucleus can recoil here uh, and, uh, and, and give you a signal at very, very low energies of approximately 10 kilo electron volts. Uh, and uh, there's, there's many experiments now going around the world trying to, trying to detect this signal. Uh, we have two, of course, basic predictions for the cross-section. Uh, it can be spin independent uh, when the dark matter interacts uh, sort of with the whole nucleus where you get this coherent enhancement uh, uh, in the, in the cross-section. Uh, uh, and uh, spin-dependent interactions. Um, so this is this is the re this is the region, of course, we're, we're most sensitive to right now because you get this coherent enhancement in the in the cross section at low energies. And um, here's some of the uh, here is I believe the, the most um, one of the more uh, recent um, uh, uh, limits one of the most recent figures that shows the most updated sets of limits on the annihilation cross section. Uh, versus went, went mass here. Of course, there's various theoretical predictions um, uh, from supersymmetry, et cetera. Uh, so the Z9100 limit, uh, which was announced, um, what, July of uh, 2012 or so, um, is, this, is this band here. And actually, they use the same color scheme as Fermi did. I don't know whether that's, uh, that's in there or not. But, uh, um, but so, there's, uh, they, so they reported no, no events uh, that, that were uh, consistent with the dark matter interpretation. Um, that does not mean that other experiments have not seen si uh, signals that are consistent with the dark matter interpretation. Uh, in particular, there's a big mess going on down here right now, about 10 giga electron volts, where several uh, experiments, including DAMA, Cogent, Crest, um, and now CDMS, uh, has uh, reported a potential signal of, uh, of, of uh, or I shouldn't say reported a signal, but reported a signal <laughs> that they cannot explain by their known, by their known backgrounds uh, in this regime. So the question is, you know, what's going on down there, um, and how do how does our understanding of where the dark matter is, and you know, how fast it's moving, how does that affect the interpretation of these signals? So, um, you know, when when the xenon results, 100 results came out, uh, they set the world's best limits, uh, didn't find anything, but then the CDMS new, recent CDMS results came out uh, in, the, in their silicon detectors and said, hey, we've got we've got we've got three events that we can't explain. And then naively, if you just look at these, if you just look at these, uh, if you compare these limits to each other, they're, they're barely consistent with one another, right? So somebody's got to be wrong. So something's got to give somewhere, more uh, more than likely. Um, okay, so uh, there's a few generic ways to make these results consistent. One, you know, maybe it's just some, some experimental noise or backgrounds that, that, that the experiments don't understand yet, which is which is certainly um, an avenue that needs to be studied. Um, uh, you know, particle maybe maybe something's crazy is going on with the with in the particle sector and the and the, and the model you often see here discussed is this you know uh, depending on who you talk to not not very well named isospin violating dark matter where where the where the cross section is different with the protons and the neutrons and therefore you know, each of these experiments has different you know xenon versus silicon has different um, different ratios of protons and neutrons so you could change that cross section in the appropriate way uh, the the question we were interested in asking recently is can, can you just is there a consistent picture of the galactic halo model that actually that actually makes these results uh, uh, compatible with one another? And actually, it turns out that's uh, surpri um, so somewhat surprisingly there's a, there's there's an easy way to do this. Um, uh, and, and and what you do here is sort of appeal not to the distributions that have been put in for the dark matter to these results, but appeal to uh, what more we might expect uh, in in our that the, the models that we might expect that are predicted from our models of uh, cosmological structure formation. So specifically, if you look at these uh, dark matter only simulations, very high resolution dark matter only simulations of Milky Way like galaxies, uh, you get you get velocity distribution functions which are which are particularly non Maxwellian, uh, particularly very far out on the tail of these distributions. And, and, and I should say that the uh, the experiments all, all, all assume that you know we have this sort of ideal sort of standard halo model picture. Of the velocity distribution, but but these simulations are actually telling a different story. So uh, you know, even, even though um, it, it looks small here on this figure, this is actually a significant um, deviation comparing the Maxwell prediction to the prediction from numerical simulations uh, out on the tail here, and what you what you might deduce uh, the number of events you might deduce from in, in, in experiments. Because you know, once again, we're we're very sensitive to to the you know highest velocity dark matter particles that exist, right, in, the, in these experiments. So, 
So here's a sort of the same figure plotted up on a log scale where we stacked a bunch of halos together, and that's where you get this gray band here. And just you know, there's, there's a bunch of noise here, but, but just note, just just take note here that this is this is the standard halo model prediction, um, and it really overpredicts what's going on here out of the tail. Okay, so the question is, you know, is this just voodoo, right? Are we just like putting in the simulations and you know giving us some answer out that okay, good, let's take that. Well, it's actually no, right? You can actually analytically say, you know, from from you know models that we expect, as I'll talk about in a few minutes here, Navarro, Frank, White based models of dark matter halos. You can actually take those models and make some simple assumptions, and you can actually predict this behavior. Uh, so you know, if we believe if we believe that dark matter is distributed uh, uh, in some ways, like uh, like we see in these simulations, and you know, some level like we see out in the uh, out in galaxies, then then this effect should exist at some level, right? So 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 these standard Maxwell Boltzmann distributions are not correct. And one you know, we tried to popularize this idea a few months ago, right? Um, and 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 really this just tries to get the point across here that you know here's here's our xenon nuclei, a nucleus sitting in a bath of dark matter, and here's our silicon nucleus, and you know you can see this this is more likely to be scattered. <laughs> Uh, in some way, uh, it, it, or this is less likely to be scattered in the dark matter scenario. The xenon is less likely to be scattered in the dark matter scenario than it is sort of in the standard Maxwell Boltzmann scenario. Okay, so this is just this, this is just the basic predictions now that we can extract from our from our models of cosmology. And it turns out you can actually quantify you can actually quantify this, and that's what we did in this recent analysis in 2013 here. Um, uh, and I won't I won't bore you here with the, what this function looks like, but but you can actually go look it up here, and you can see this is actually. Uh, just a, a very simple two-parameter model that fits these distributions, uh, and what you can actually find here is if you if you sort of plot up the scattering these distributions uh, uh, that we that we see in the simulations, uh, it turns out that in a vast region of this parameter space, sort of uh, up in this region here, uh, the these these experiments are actually perfectly consistent with one another. And it all goes back to this point that we're missing particles from the high energy tail of this distribution, right? So xenon's not seeing anything, whereas lighter nuclei are seeing things. So okay. I'm not saying that this is this is a. So, but suppose we, since we know that we have baryons, in the, so yes, the baryons. Yeah. So would that change um, drastically? So just um, so may, I, I, I can't give you a conclusive answer. I will say we're most sensitive to the highest energy, the highest velocity particles in the distribution, mm -hmm. and so we're more or less just sensitive to particles that are kind of coming on these sort of long orbits. So maybe they haven't spent too much time, you know, mucking around with baryons and disc formed. Okay. Very hand wavy. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we need to do that for real. So, so, so say that again. You said if there are variants, what happens? I mean, Whether all the so. yeah the velocity distribution since he he's matching this simulation and simulations yeah. don't include baryons. So now claim is it's not Maxwell. Uh, Maxwellian, but uh, that's okay. But the question is, is this velocity distribution correct if yeah. you include the variants? That yeah. I, 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 so it's, the th there's actually been some sentiment that it actually, unfortunately, you go back more to a max yeah, yeah. distribution when you add baryons yeah. because the baryons cool. Exactly. So that's the yeah. Uh, but but you know I, we're not no. sophisticated okay. enough. To, to, but to, to when you include baryons, we are. I, I just don't just the disk forming, right? Just, just the you know. So but, the effect of baryons on the dark matter halo, right? So they yeah. scatter all the baryons. In the yeah, so the idea is maybe introduce more random interaction. Mm -hmm. And this the distribution is at the solar galactocentric radius, right? Or, or not? Yeah, or it's, yeah it's, it's, at our, it's at our radius, right? At our radius. You can actually see it shift, actually. You see it shift in a well in a well prescribed way as you go away from, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the baryons introduce potential wells, right? That, that would function the way the, the tight distribution. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I understand. Well, the, adding the baryons doesn't it create introduce a small potential well, but it's taking some of the loss otherwise it's going through the gravitational. Oh, we, uh, I have to think about that. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think the, the idea is like if this picture that it makes it more max, that the baryons make it more max well, it's right. It's just sort mm -hmm. of introducing more interactions between in some ways. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. More needs to go. Actually, so the good, one reason I wanted to bring this up too is I heard the other day that Lux experiment in South Dakota is going to come out with new results end of month here. And you know, I, I'm not saying that this is that you know CDMS has detected dark matter. <laughs> That'd be nice if you did. But uh, um, and this is the solution. But this solution actually can be tested by Lux right now, basically by by dropping their thresholds. Uh, and and we will. So so sort of this is really cool because like immediately we're learning something about about astrophysics and, and how 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 it affects the signal. I mean, the, the, 
that uncertainty is so high, you can't even test the velocity of the function. Because yeah, I, 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 I can. You have to run it like one k v threshold, five k v. But but in order to, so in order to test like this, the way we constructed this hypothesis here, Lux can Lux can you know, so CDMS sees three, Xenon sees nothing, right? Uh, if Lux sees nothing down to this threshold, then, then you know this model. But those are ninety percent. Oh okay <laughs> yeah, uh, let's, or, or not okay yeah okay yeah and, uh, we will find a way around this again. So. <laughs> Um, so if Xenon ran at extremely low threshold, then it would be much better. Yeah, but they, that's, I, I don't know what you mean by extremely low here. Maybe like a KDB. Uh, it's impossible. My okay. experimental friends tell me that's difficult. Uh, mm. Xenon 1 KDB. OK, um, so I actually want to spend the last few minutes here talking about uh, like my, uh, my, my fourth bullet point, actually, was, which was how do we deduce properties of dark matter from sort of more classical uh, astronomical observations. Um, and, uh, and there's, there's there's some really interesting work going on these days. So let me just give you a very sort of lightning review of what we know about structure formation. Of course, uh, you know if you had dark matter eyes uh, in the universe on scales about 100 megaparsecs or so, you'd see a distribution that looks like you see here on your left. And uh, these these bright regions are just regions of high dark matter density. Um, you zoom in here to one of these filaments, uh, and you have a region around like we we expect our Milky Way to reside in. And immediately you notice that this distribution is not smooth, but is contained uh, in a large fractions of dark matter mass contained in a substructure or subhalos, as I'll sometimes call them. Um, and sort of give you a point of reference here, our Milky Way disk would just be a dot kind of right in the center of this, of this figure here. Um, you know, by, by all accounts, we might, uh, you know, various numerical simulations would predict that we have 10, 50 percent of our dark matter not in a smooth component, but in these lumps, okay? Uh, uh, and, and at some level, we believe that these lumps correspond to uh, the satellite galaxies that I talked about um, earlier. Of course, you know that it's really enough, it's a it's a topic for another seminar, in fact, another you know conference, uh, how to do that mapping. But but uh, I just want to make a point here going forward that uh, these simulations uh, and these, this modeling actually gives us uh, two very well known predictions for the structure of dark matter from sort of standard cold dark matter uh, models. And uh, to, uh, to two of those are the fact that one, the density profile rises towards the center of the galaxy, so you don't, you know, the dark matter doesn't, uh, to the resolutions of these simulations, doesn't come make a constant density core. Um, it would be, behave something like this classical Navarro Frank White model that I've got plotted here does. Uh, and two, the abundance of these substructures or subhalos uh, in the Milky Way, right, it gives us a, a prediction that these subhalos combine, you know, you know 10, 50 percent maybe the mass of the Milky Way. Um, and, and many of these models have been run here, uh, and we, we now have a precise you know, mass function of these subhalos, and it goes like uh, m to the minus 1.9, and that's significant because it tells us that most of the mass of this population is out here in the heaviest things, right? But most of the number is down here, right? So we're, we're not diverging towards the center. So if we, if we integrated all the mass in this component, we, we get, you know, <laughs> we get just the, the, the largest things here. So that's what tells us about the mass function. So those are the predictions, of course. And any time you have theoretical predictions, you have tension with observations. Um, and that's exactly what happens here. Um, so it's been well known in the past couple decades that sort of simple estimates of the density pro densities of, of faint dark matter dominated galaxies, uh, they tend to be uh, less dense than it's predicted than those of our Frank White models are predicted in numerical simulations. And the, you know, the, question, the, the, the argument, of course, is, is, is this observational systematics um, is is you know, are the baryons affecting what's going on here? Uh, are, are are you know ma many different ways to uh, many different ways to look at this? Is, is the nature of dark matter different than what we put in our sim CDM simulations? Is some, could be telling us something about dark matter cosmology? Um, of course, and also this classical missing satellites problem. Is that I, sh I showed you all those dark matter subhalos around the Milky Way. Well, it turns out if you remember from the original picture of the satellites, there's only about a couple dozen of these that we see. Around our galaxy, so the question is, what happened there, right? So, our, you know, if CDM's right, either we haven't found many of these, or for some reason, all of them are dark. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's there's several reasons, there's several predictions for why this distribution, for why those we, we have a population of dark subhalos. Uh, you know, this is it's going to be talked mainly about dark matter. So let me just run through some of the more recent dark matter dark matter based solutions to this issue. 
So here's on, the, on your left here, here's a standard cold dark matter simulation. Um, and here's a, uh, here's a war so a warm dark matter simulation where you, you give the particle a little bit more uh, residual velocity uh, in the early universe uh, than, than in the standard cold scenario. And as you expect, and as has been long, as has been long um, believed, uh, theoretically, you, you, your, your, your population of cell payloads is significantly less in this universe than it is in this universe, okay? So, you know, it's, it's intriguing to know, and, and I'm just showing this now, right, because right now we're just kind of getting the resolution to, to do these simulations to resolve the substructure on Milky Way mass galaxies in, in, in these different alternative, uh, alternative, alternative universes. Um, and it turns out, as we pointed out, you actually have this, this, solu this satellite solution is particularly mitigated in these warm dark matter scenarios uh, and the idea here is, you know, not only are there fewer cell payloads that get destroyed, right, that, that, that even form, right, in, in these universes, but they also, they're also very easily destroyed because they're much less dense than, than the corresponding, uh, corresponding cell payloads in the CDN cases. Is anybody working on this question where we give up on there being one and only one? Um, I would say there is probably more than likely more than one type of dark matter, <laughs> but, but given where we are right now, I think we have to examine sort of the, you know, the spectrum of it's all this, it's all that, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I guess at some level I've theoretically given up on that. <laughs> but, but, you know, in terms of like, what can you prove? Yeah, what can you right. prove? What can uh, you prove that you did I don't know, I'm just saying yeah. that, you know, with, you know, if you try to shove everything into one box, you miss it. I, you know, so you need neutrinos are dark matter. Like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so for example, AMS, this, uh, what AMS has found is dark matter. And what CDMS, Xeno, or Dama, Koja, yeah, they right. found dark, dark matter. A, dark matter B, dark and then you'll see that you need two different scales. So if those results are correct, yeah. of course you're saying something. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there's another scenario which people talk about. I guess I, I'm, I'm a little bit less of a fan of this theoretically. Uh, Self interacting dark matter, where you jack up the dark matter. <laughs> Self-interacting cross-section by 20 words of magnitude. Just, just why not? Okay, you know, and of course, theory. You can write down a theory to do this, right? Uh, but, uh, but, but now, you know, astronomers have now drank this Kool-Aid and uh, and are now doing simulations of this. And so here's the CDM scenario. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's interesting in the sense that okay, you know, we the the predictions that you might not really expect. You know, our our halos are more round. There's fewer of them. They're less dense. These actually come to fruition in these models. Um, uh, you know, there's particle scenarios that you can. Construct, of course, to do this, but but this is, these are sort of now the standard dark matter explanations, and you know these are now sort of caught on in some level because you know they're we're now realizing this, and you know uh, with, with with the simulations, and they're they're you know better agreeing with with, with the observations in some level. So for the last few minutes of this talk here, what I actually really want to do here, so I'm going to put this theory aside, right, and I'm going to like go into the data here and ask us, you know. It, what is the data really telling us about these these small scale structure issues? You know, do we really need alternatives to CDM? Uh, and the answer I'm going to argue is it's not clear we actually do. I think there's still significant uncertainties. There's still significant systematics in these astrophysical observations uh, that that um, that we we don't need to abandon this. You know, get jump off the CDM uh, wagon at this point. Um, okay, so. Uh, and, uh, going back once again to the dwarf spheroidal, right? I said these were the most dark matter dominated objects we know in the universe and you know incredibly interesting from an astronomical perspective for many different reasons um, you know I said we measure the mass of these systems very very precisely just because diagrams like this here we have velocity dispersions of the stars in these systems right very explicitly uh, out to um, you know out to kiloparsecs or so out to the, the extent we see these galaxies um, and, and of course what you notice here is that uh, you know this is the, this is the contribution from the stars all these dash curves Right, and these all miserably fail. So you, so you have to have dark matter, which are represented by these bits here. Okay, so we know that there is dark matter in these systems. What we really want to do is, can we actually understand the dark matter distribution in these very central regions? Okay, because that would tell us about, you know, the, that would really test these CDM predictions. Well, a couple of years ago, what we did is we actually went to this high resolution data, and we actually went through and we fit these dwarf squirrels to um, the bar Frank White based profiles, and we found that everything, it, you know, completely works and everything. Great. Um, uh, we can fit velocity dispersions. We can fit the observed distribution of stars with these with these uh, um, uh, with these CDM NFW based models. Um, you know, constructed a detailed dynamical model to do this. And you know, the question is, right? Have, have we solved the problem? Okay. As, as you know, do we need to stop working on this? Well, actually, no. We don't need to stop working on this because 
uh, something more interesting has happened in the past few years, um, and, uh, and there's been a lot of noise uh, made about this particular fact, is, is that you know, these stars that we see in the Doris Firma, they're not a single population of stars, right? There's different groups. There's, you know, one population has higher metallicity, one population has lower metallicity, and they probably formed it at a different point, right? So they all sort of obey their own uh, dynamics and obey their own distribution function. And really, in no galaxy is that shown more clearly than this, this sculptor, Dwarf Sroyder, where you have an inner population that has, been, that has very high metallicity, okay, and an outer population which has lower metallicity. And, and very interestingly, actually, if you take this outer population, you have a dispersion profile like we see uh, from the previous Dwarf Sroyder, just examining this, calling it a single population. But then when you look at this inner population, you get something very different. Uh, you get a very, very steeply declining profile in the outer regions. And so what this, what this dynamically tells us is that the stars in these systems, they're on, they're on very radial orbits, right? So this is just geometry, actually, if you think about this for a second. So, so, so you know, stars are very, they're, they're all going out, passing, passing very close to the center. So we don't, we don't know why this is true yet, but this, this has to be true This is a, this is an equilibrated population. Okay, so, so some, several authors have recently examined this data and said if I examine those two populations separately, I get something that's inconsistent with a CDM-based model, like the 99% confidence level. Okay, and they they do it based upon sort of more simplified mass estimators uh, to to examine the, the mass distribution of the galaxies, sort of not sort of full stellar distribution function models of, uh, uh, that that we really need. So probably more famous results come out of this group Walker and Penarubia. There's also um, more uh, recent results from the group Cambridge, uh, on yellow and uh, Win Evans uh, and several students. And the way that they tried to phrase this was. You know, if you take the NFW profile with its two parameters here, the scale density and the scale radius, and you fit to this inner population, this inner, this inner metal rich population, you get a band that looks like this. In the metal poor population, you get something that like, looks like this. And the fact that these two don't overlap tells you that, 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 that your hypothesis of an NFW profile is incorrect. Okay. Um, uh, so what's going on? Are we, are, is this now proof that we, you know, NFW profiles are incorrect and this, therefore our CDM based model is not true? Well, actually, so results that I'm hopefully going to publish here very shortly, we actually went back and did a full uh, dynamical stellar distribution function modeling of these galaxies. Uh, and we actually did find, uh, intriguingly, that uh, you can actually go through, sort of divorce yourself from more simplified scenarios. You can construct a full model that fits all these populations. And here's just an example of, of how this works. Um, you know, there's a few specific predictions we can make uh, based upon the scenario. Um, I, I will say, so sort of at the end of the day, you're sort of looking at individual galaxies. You have to be very, very careful, very careful saying whether something is inconsistent with CDM or not, right? Because there's been, there's been um, you know, lots of, lots of um, you know, people pointing to this and saying that this clearly rules out this scenario. And I think, you know, you really need to get your hands dirty and look at every single galaxy if you really want to do this. Um, okay. So, right, I've been painting this picture that, you know, people try to shoot down CDM. We come along and say, and everything's fine, don't worry about it, let's keep going along. Um, there is some residual uncertainty here, and I think I want to spend the last couple minutes here talking about this. So, so when we do these fits, right, and we get um, NFW-based fits to the dwarf steroidals, um, we, we, we have unique predictions for what the masses of these systems are. Okay? Uh, then you know, we can actually go into the simulations that are, that, that are run based upon CDM, and we can compare those masses to the mass distribution of, of subpages that we see in CDM. And um, the, the interesting thing that comes out of this is that, for some reason, all these, all these subpages that we see are clustered at relatively low mass here, right? So, so this is in terms of peak circular velocity of the subhalo. That's what this is. So basically, the mass goes out here. So they're all kind of clustered down here. OK, which is all right. You might say, that's fine. That's the way the world is. Um, here's where we believe our Magellanic clouds live, uh, but the issue is there's there's dozens more subhalos in these simulations that are much more massive than these dwarfs than these dwarf uh, that, that 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 we've measured. So you know right you know we've gone through and done our fits and we've determined this is a masses, but what the hell happened here is the question, right? So where are these guys? Um, so for some reason, if if what we've done is correct, if this simulation we've done is correct, if our interpretation of the data is correct. We have to explain why why we're not why we're missing a large population of relatively massive um, dwarf photos, and this is sort of the modern incarnation of the uh, of the missing satellites issue. But what's the typical size? About physical size, about a kiloparsec or so. Yeah. So you know, what's the resolution of those? 
Oh, so they actually get down to, they can resolve particles within about uh, 100 parsecs. So they resolve some halo. Yeah, so they resolve, they can measure density profiles accurately within 100 parsecs or so. Yeah, okay. Are the dark subhalos ruled out for some reason? No, dark subhalos are not ruled out, but, but you know, theory, explain, explain why that happened. You know, come up, you know, come up, with a, come up with an astrophysical model where that happened, right? It, it's actually, originally it's thought, okay, I've got feedback, supernova blowing out stars, but, but you know, why are they preferentially, you know, you know why, why, don't see, why don't we see anything, <laughs> right, nothing? Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so, right, there's a few solutions here, right? So this is where these dark matter scenarios now are, are, are gaining steam here because you don't have this population in the warm or self-interacting models. Okay, um, you know, there's been, you know, the baryons are always around, they're never gonna go away, right? You can always construct baryonic solutions. Uh, maybe there's observational systematics going on, and that's what I want to spend the last minute here talking about, uh, an experiment we're coming up with to try to, to, try to test uh, observational systematics here. Okay, so there's two, uh, I've spent most of this talk, I've spent all this talk talking about dark matter uh, scenarios, uh, solutions to these problems. Uh, I haven't talked about baryons, you know, the feedback mechanisms, and, and you know, people are starting, now starting to put in baryons, detailed processes into these, into these high resolution simulations, and here's, here's just an example of, 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 the, of the work that's been done. Um, you know, of course, we have to be careful about interpreting these again, but, uh, but, but you know, we're, we're making progress. Uh, the, the solution I really like, because it's a very testable scenario, especially what we in the next few years, is, is our Milky Way weird in some way, right? Maybe every other type of galaxy like our Milky Way has, you know, this massive, this large population of, of, of bright galaxies around it, right? Where, and maybe, maybe galaxies fill in here, oops, maybe galaxies fill in this gap here, right? But for some reason we fluctuate it down. For some reason there's a huge amount of scatter in the population of satellites around Milky Way-like galaxies, which we haven't quantified at all yet. Okay, so, you know, my, 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 my planet example here is, right, you know, 20 years ago we thought, we thought the solar system was all there is, right? And now we observe, you know, planetary systems of all shape and variety, and you know we don't see anything that looks like, like the solar system. Okay, so so maybe 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 something's going on here. We've underestimated how much scatter there is uh, in this in the population of satellite, like in this population of dwarf squirrels around Milky Way like galaxies. Okay, so we've actually been able to quantify this a little better in the past few years, and um, you know the Magellanic clouds are bright, so you can actually go around in surveys and search for you know, Magellanic clouds around other like Milky Way-like galaxies, right? Uh, and you find about 5% of uh, Milky Way-like galaxies have systems that look like the Magellanic clouds in terms of their brightness. So this 5% number says, so this says, you know, statistically, our, our Milky Way is about a, a 2.7 some sigma fluctuation, something along those lines in terms of its popul population of satellites. Okay, that's fine. Um, population of Magellanic clouds-like satellites. Okay, uh, but however, right, we need to actually drill deeper to solve this issue, solve this modern issue of where these guys are and try to see if these guys exist around other Milky Ways. Okay, so that's what we tried to do in the past, uh, a couple of years ago here. We asked, you know, how faint can you go? Uh, and we were actually uh, running out of resolution pretty quickly, but we were able to place uh, upper bounds on the number of objects brighter than uh, the Fornax or Schroedel, which I mentioned earlier, which is the brightest of these objects, you know, 10 to the 7 solar luminosities. Uh, we weren't actually able to make a measurement here, but, but these points here re represent sort of the mean number of satellites around Milky Way-like galaxies going to fainter and fainter magnitude. So here's our data points here, right? Uh, and here's where we cross here, uh, the, the limits here. So this our upper bound sort of at the Fornax regime was about 13, 13 objects, right? Brighter than the Fornax or steroidal uh, around other Milky Way-like galaxies. But, you know, if you compare this to this number here, 25 to 75, that's still pretty low, okay? So what we concluded very broadly from this surveys we've done, from basically this was analysis of Sloan data, is that given, given the way we've done this observation now, our Milky Way galaxy seems pretty normal, right, in terms of the mean of this distribution, right? So, you know, your Copernican hat, right, you put on, like that's, that, that, that's a pretty pleasing answer at some level, right? Uh, we still need to do this measurement much better, which we're gonna do uh, in the future with, uh, with, with more detailed surveys. Uh, and I think we will actually nail this question much better in the, uh, uh, going going forward here. Uh, yeah. You brought it to different era, but the solid. Yeah. Uh, oh, so this is a technical. This is a, this is a technical thing about how how the, whether we use spectroscopy uh, or photometry or not for it to get the measurement. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
Okay, good. So, sort of, I, I, I hope I've come across here that really, in order to understand what, what to make out of what's going on in the dark matter searches, we really need to understand not only what's going on in the, in the particle physics sector, but really have a good understanding of astrophysics and cosmology, right? Because that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of work there to be done. Uh, I hope I convinced you that, uh, you know, the work we've done in indirect searches complementing the, the, the direct search methods and, you know, the, 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 the collider-based methods, uh, we're, we're actually now ruling out really interesting uh, uh, predictions for, for wet dark matter. Um, you know, and the interplay, of course, is very important. And the analogy I like to make, which sometimes I get a little pushback on, but I think it's very broadly true, is, um, you know, these, these searches, these gravitational lensing searches for, for compact bodies that have happened in the past couple decades around our Milky Way have set explicit upper limits on, you know, most of the dark matter cannot be in objects ranging from the mass of Mercury, you know, to about 10 or so times the mass of the Sun. So these are the upper bounds here, right? So the fraction of, of the mass of the halo in these objects is, is uh, in, a, in those tight upper bounds here. So right, right now, right, so we're right in the middle of this game here where we're doing something very similar, right? Placing, placing limits on, on very well-motivated particle scenarios. And of course, right, this isn't all the particle scenarios anyone could ever, anyone could ever construct. And, you know, one can make an argument that even if we go down, keep, this keeps going down and down here, we'll never really ultimately rule out all wind models. Okay, that's certainly true, but, but you know, we're, we're at this stage now. So uh, going back to Vera Rubin here, here's a, here's a quote I'd like to show from her. So she says, uh, in a spiral galaxy, dark to light mass ratio is about a factor of 10. You know, that's about, gives our ignorance to our knowledge of what these, these galaxies are composed of. You know, she says, okay, we're out of kindergarten, but about in the third grade. So she said that years ago. So third grade, where are we now? I don't know, middle school. So, so uh, So questions, comments? Yeah. So, well, the last part of your story is so, assuming a CDL and consider the, the, the galaxy formation, wouldn't the result of the clustering of dark matter strongly depend on the, the details of the formation of the galaxy? For example, look okay, at yeah. the velocity distribution of dark matter at the moment of formation. If it, if it had very slow dispersion, very low dispersion, it would be, you know, advected by the formation of barriers. That, I mean, that's why, need to, I, I that's why we need to, I think that's why we need to do these types of experiments here. Uh, you know, how rare is the galaxy? You know, what do we like relative to other? Yeah, but what I said applies both to the Milky Way, but even more to some ancient dwarf, you know, steroidals, yeah. which yeah. were probably formed earlier, and they experienced much less of the that, That's true. I mean, I will say we don't know there's models for how dwarf steroidals form, but obviously we don't have a full story, right? Because we can't, you know, we start from our theoretical picture, and there, there's a disconnect there. Um, and so certainly every single one, you know, some might have formed in a high density environment, right. you know, uh, near an ionizing source and got, uh, you know, got all the gas and started blowing out. Some might have formed in a relatively isolated region of the universe and said, okay, nothing much happened to me. So here I am, I'm living, you know, and now I'm, you know, relatively bright when I, when I fall into a big potential well like the Milky Way. So, yeah, and those are, uh, you know, those are the explanations now for, the, those are the CDM based explanations for, to, to these situations. And, and they're, they're not by any means, I don't think, far fetched, right? It's just, it's just how to, it's just how to quantify sure. these processes is, 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 the, is, is the trick. Yeah. Uh, can I put aside you where you showed Atlas with that? Oh, Atlas? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, that one? No. no. So this is based on homogeneity. Yeah. How do I translate to the copy to BB bar? To BB bar. Yeah. Oh, uh, you had to just yeah, you had to make an assumption that it's 100% annihilation to BB bar, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got to do something right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, right. Is this picture that simple, right? Probably not. But, um, so we are preparing for paper for. Yeah, I thought there was a, wasn't there a CMS paper about this or no? Oh, yeah. We didn't put this cross section. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're doing that now. I'm actually interested to see what you also. Yep. Uh, can you detect dark matter subcables by gravitational lasing? Or they are too low? I wish. Um, too, too diffuse, actually. Too late. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've had a nipple for every theorist uh, who's tried this. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, NFW, even though they're steep, R to the minus one in the center, 
if you you know they're 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 below the critical density for lensing, okay. it turns out at, at all the at all the appropriate ranges. But you know, if there's been an oblongs that have detected, so who knows, maybe maybe it's picture wrong. Any more questions? Okay, so let's thank our speaker again.